everyone. I'm Karen Combs and welcome to my floss tube number 12. Uh, this channel is one that I use for my quilt videos, quilt tutorials, but I also use it for my stitching and this is what this video is about, cross stitching specifically and it's number 12. It is, I'm checking my notes, it is May 5th and Friday, I started to say Thursday, but it's Friday, and I'm going to be uploading this tomorrow morning, so Saturday morning, but been busy this last few weeks. Um, I'll show you some of the whips I have. You might want to grab a um, pencil and paper or something to take notes on, because later I've added a couple videos with some different information that you might want to take note of. But this week, uh, I've been working out in the garden and I posted some pictures on my Instagram, which I'll put the link to that in uh, the description. And I also, was it Tuesday and Wednesday, Monday and Tuesday, something like that, worked in the flower garden where we have, you know, giant hydrangea bushes. And I was almost hesitant to film because I was working in there and got scratched all up on my arms, most of it doesn't show, but when I came in the house after working, uh, cutting these dried out dead stalks, I came in to wash my hands and I looked and <laughs> had blood all down my arms, even though I had long sleeves on, I thought, okay, I need to get some of those gardening sleeves. Have you seen those? I guess they, they fit over your arms. Um, so I thought, well, I'll have to do that. But the reason I was working in these giant hydrangea bushes that we have is we had a freeze back in December. And it was right around Christmas. We were 60 degrees, and within about 12 hours, we were below zero wind chill. Horrible winds. And we thought most of our landscaping was dead, but it's slowly coming back. And the hydrangeas were coming back in March and they, they looked fine, except in March, we had another freeze of, I think it was two or three days of 17 and 19 degrees. And they were already starting to bud. We are south of Nashville, so we're zone seven. So, you know, we have some warm days in February and March. They'd started to bud. And that frost, heavy frost that we got in March, just sapped them. So we won't have any blossoms this year. And reading some of the gardening posts uh, for our area, uh, it's basically re recommended. Check the stalks, see if they're dead, prune them down. And I, on my hydrangeas, they only blossom on old wood. So I really didn't want to do that. But checking a few of them, 90% were dead. And the last few I just went ahead and trimmed. So I doubt we'll have blossoms this year. But that's what I was doing that I got my arms all scratched up, but the, it's healing. So I decided I'll go ahead and do the video because it doesn't really show too much on the video. So we'll do that. So what I've been working on stitching wise is I did a little bit of work on Quaker Dwelling which you've seen this before, and I don't stitch on it much, but when I'm doing something where I need to concentrate on, maybe I'm visiting with somebody or attending a virtual guild meeting, something like that, I will sit and work on this because where I'm at right now, and I love this, but I'm working on all of the mortar and the bricks and it's a lot of just plain stitching. So I did a little bit more of that. So hold this up so you can see. Did uh, uh, somewhere down in here. Um, and I mentioned that I'm going to be visiting with some friends and that will probably be after the next floss tube. I got my dates mixed up, but I thought, well, I can work on the door. I can work on the windows. Did I get the windows? Yeah, I started stitching the windows more of the mortar, I got some more bricks to fill in and I've got the door. So I've been working on that. And that one, I think the windows, because the windows took a while. So I just thought I'll keep working on that. And before I forget, I have my calendar here. We've talked about this before. I'm not a journaler, just never have been. 
but I enjoy keeping track of what I'm stitching on or when I'm taping floss tubes or things that are happening. So this is April and May I have a few stickers. I've got to add some more. I'm going to stand up so I can see what you're seeing. So have that and on Tuesday we had the virtual guild meeting with the Tudor Rose uh, Stitching Guild, which I talked about, I think, in Floss Tube 10. So check that out. We had a wonderful meeting, and Katie Stratton was our speaker. It was wonderful. So if you're interested in a virtual guild meeting, check that out in my Floss Tube 10. I think it was 10 that we talked about that. And I forgot to show this in my last video because I did work on this and finish house three. And this is my Houses of Hawthorne, ha I gotta get it right. Houses of Hawk Run Hollow. So I'm, uh, let's see, there we go. Finished house three. So let me show you that. And this is one that once I pick it up, I want to work on it. So I'm working on something else right now. So I did set my goal to finish three. So this is where I'm at. So we've got house one, house two, and just started. And you can see in the corner there, just the start of house four, which will look like this. So when I get house four done, then the whole top row will be done. So did work on that. I forgot to show you that last time, but what I've been mostly working on is, let me set this aside and you've seen this, but there's a reason why I'm working very diligently on it and I can't share that yet, but I will, a couple floss tubes from now, but it is the Sarah Milthrop. 1834, and this was one of the projects that we got at the Attic Center Symposium. And you've seen this, I've been working on this for a while. I wanted to show you the progress. I love this sampler. So I started working on the over one, and I'm going to put a a video in here in just a moment talking about how I did the over one and I worked on the house. I got the house done. Look at this house. Let me move it up. Look at that house. And started on some of the motifs. Now on the house, I'm going to show you on the chart. On the house, you can see the roof is a lighter green with kind of a straw color. The door is the same, I think it's the same straw color as that's in the roof. The windows are dark green and around the window, the window sills is that straw color. Now, I had the idea, and sometimes ideas work and sometimes they don't, but what I decided to do, and actually if you look at my Instagram, I think it was a post or two ago, you'll see what I did, and then I changed it. But what I did was I took the house and I decided to do a light green windowsill, because I thought, well, that will look very nice against the dark green window, and then do the light green door. And I started doing that and I didn't like it. And I, like I said, I posted that picture on Instagram and I looked at that and went, I don't like it. And I didn't have much of the door stitched. So that was easy to take out, but I had most of the window sills done. So I had to take them out and I did. So that took a couple of days and I wanted to share with you a couple tools that I found that was helpful when I was taking it out because of course I had the dark green already done. So I had to be very careful not to disturb that. So I wanted to share with you a couple tools 
that I found useful when I was doing that. And you now sometimes with decisions like that, we go ahead and say, yep, I like it, or I'm so far into it, I'm not going to take it out, but this one, I'm glad that I did. But we've talked about this one before, the Stitcher's Best Friend. I posted about this a few floss tubes ago. This has two ends, and it's this end I was using. Let me get it in the camera. It has two ends. It's this end that I was using. Can I get a better picture of that? There we go. Now this little curve, don't you know what? There we go, that little curved edge. What it does is it goes right into the stitch and lifts it up. A lot of times I'll use my needle and pull it out. Well, this little bit of a curve let me get really close. Where's my camera? There it is. Really works. So I use this to help me lift it out. Then I showed you these scissors last time. I love these scissors, and this is what I've been using. These are the Ernest Wright scissors. But for when I was pulling the stitches out and kind of cutting away the little fuzzy edges, I found these scissors worked really well. These are Ginger. They're four inch, I think I posted that a few times ago on the floss tube. But see how they have a curved edge? And I'm going to. Now, what that allows you to do is lay it so it's tilted just a little bit so you can snip anything close without getting the linen. And they're extremely sharp. I was able to get right up close with them. And I know that is something that's, well, I always get a little nervous when I'm cutting away things. I don't want to cut the linen. And I remember watching a floss tube with Jean Farish, and she said, and this stuck with me, when you're cutting, as long as you can see both tips, you're okay. So slip it into the stitch, make sure I see both tips and no linen in there, then I can snip it. So these scissors helped me with that. And, and I'm not going to um, make it all uh, rosy. It took a while to do, but these tools helped me. So a couple more. These are, and if you do any quilting, especially machine quilting, you probably have a pair of these, just the... Um, tweezers that I probably have some kind of name, but because they're very uh, pointy, I could lift the little pieces out as I was snipping. And I wasn't dragging everything as I was pulling it out. I would undo a couple stitches and then snip that tail off so you're not dragging all that. So that helped. And then the fourth thing that I used, and we talked about boo-boo brush or something like that, that little brush. So then I could brush away any little pieces very gently. So these are the things, the little brush, the uh, slanted tweezers that are very fine, the Stitcher's Best Friend, and my curved Ginger scissors. So that helped me a lot. So I got it all done. Very happy with how this beautiful house looks and here it is, so I'm going to keep working on, I want to make sure what you're seeing, keep working on probably the motifs, finish the motifs and work on the over one. Keep doing that and get this gorgeous big motif that's going to go over here. I probably ought to do some of the uh, little border um, decoration, but I'm having so much fun in the middle, I'm not gonna do that yet. So that's what I'm working on and will continue this week, well, the next two weeks. And I'll probably do and check the calendar. Here it is. We'll probably do another floss tube in two weeks because on the 20th, I have something special that I'm going to. So probably we'll tape 
floss tube in the middle of that week, but upload it for the Saturday morning of the 20th. Um, I don't have much haul this time. I only have two things. And before, now I'm going to do it this way. I did two videos of just thinking the order of it. So I have two things I have in haul, and then I'm going to put these uh, videos in. So I did receive another package of the Lakeside Linen from Traditional Stitches. This one is Vintage Homespun. And I joined a linen club, Fox and Rabbit Linen Club. And this was the first one that came, it's 40 count. It's a beautiful piece of linen, it's called Foxy. It's absolutely beautiful. But here's my question for you, and I think next time what I'm gonna do is, I've already pulled some things that I'm gonna show you that I'm thinking about using for this, but I'm gonna save it for the next video. So on a linen, because most of the time I'm using neutral, could be light, medium, dark, but some kind of a neutral. For those of you that stitch on a linen that is a color, what chart comes to mind when you see this beautiful kind of pumpkin-y, it's actually, Think of a foxtail, that's why it's called foxy. It's gorgeous, but what chart comes to mind when you see this linen? And put it down in the comments. So let me know what you think, and then the next video, or the next floss tube, we'll take a look at that. So what I'm gonna do right now is introduce the next two videos that I'm going to insert in there, and then I'll come back and say goodbye to everybody. But what I'm gonna do next is talk about this over one, because we have an Algerian eyelet, we have over one for the lettering, and I'm gonna talk about how I did it, because if you remember the last video, I was a little nervous, like, it's gonna be over one. But actually it wasn't bad. So I wanna share what I learned on that and how I'm proceeding on it. So that will be our first video. And the second video, and this is where you want may wanna take some notes. I pulled some of my lakeside linen and I pulled some other linens to show you some things that were comparable. Because I know our situation with supplies. It's hard to get linen, and especially if you're looking for specific brand, specific color. So it's nice to have choices. So I'm gonna put two videos in here. One talking about over one, and the other one talking about lakeside linen that I have, and some linens I found that were similar. So in case I need to substitute, and then we'll be back in just a few minutes, and I'll say goodbye. This is one of my works in progress uh, that we just looked at, Sarah Melthrop, 1834. And I received this as one of the projects at the Attic Sampler Symposium in January. And what I'm gonna talk about are the over ones, because the verse here, and then the name here, and the date, are all over one. And I am working on 46 count Thornfield using 103, 100.3 uh, uh, silk. So as you can see, I'm just starting this, which I was a little nervous about because I haven't done over one before. So I wanted to show it to you up close and then take a look at, I'm afraid that's gonna slide, take a look at what I've done so far close up, and what I found was helpful. So let me zoom up so you can see. 
So what we have here is, I'm going to use, <laughs> use my star pointer, <laughs> but what we have right in here are Algerian eyelet stitches and then over one and then the words are over one. So let's look at the stitches first and then we'll come back to this. So let me zoom back out. So you've got a couple of choices from doing some research and taking a look at stitches. But here is the Algerian eyelet. And over one, everything's going to come to this center point right here. So you're going to be coming from the outside over one to the center. So what I've done here is actually, I'm gonna zoom in a little closer. I've actually colored it so you can see. So we start here and we're going down into the hole. So that's one and then two is, is in the center. Three to the center. Of course, four is in the center. So five to the center, which is six. Seven to the center. Then nine to the center. 11 to the center. And 13 to the center. And one more. 15 to the center. So if it helps, at least it helped me, think about it as you're going clockwise. Every corner. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight corners, all going to the center. And you can hear this. See, I just did a freehand drawing of what it looks like when you're just drawing it, but that is the diagram. So let me bring the sampler back up because I did a couple of the Algerian eyelet. There we go. And then I switched. Okay, that's about as close as we can get, which is pretty close. So I did the Algerian eyelet on those two and that one. And it took a while because there are 16 stitches basically going into that one hole, eight, but you know, if you're counting going into the hole. So I looked at that and you know, I could keep going with it, but this is personal choice. I didn't like how thick it looked. So Starting on this section, I decided to change it to the Smyrna Cross. So let's look at that. Yeah, let's pull our diagram back up again. And, okay. So here's, we've got the Smyrna Cross. It's a little different. Now, we'll go back to the sampler so you can see that it looks similar. So here it is drawn out, but the way you do it is you go from the corner to corner. So that's one to two. Then you go to the other corner. So that starting is just like a regular cross stitch. Then you add, you can see five is in the middle, go up to six, and then go over on the right side over to the left. So the first two crosses are what we normally do, but then you've got across through the middle and it ends up here's the free hand looks like that a little faster because you're not going into the middle you're going from corner to corner corner to corner uh, bottom to top side to side so let's take a look because i did that for the rest of them zoom up again. Okay, that's as close as I can zoom. But you can see for the rest of the T, I did the Smyrna Cross and I did all of that in the Smyrna Cross. And for me personally, I liked the little bit 
of openness I got. Now I'm going to see if I can really bring this close. Ah, yes. If you can see, I don't even know if you can get... That's pretty close. So you can see, sorry for the wobbling, I'm trying to hold it still. But after doing the Algerian Eyelet, I decided to change to the Smyrna Cross. And the reason that I knew it would be okay is I've watched other floss tubes that talk about over one. And almost everyone mentions that Jean from the attic has said it's fine to switch. So I went ahead. Now, if you're doing a true reproduction where it's totally rep reproducing that sampler, then you would want to stay with the Algerian eyelet. But I decided for me personally, it was fine. So I'm going to continue. Let me show you. my star pointer. So you can see the capital letters are all done with Algerian and then I think there's some down in here too. So I will continue with that with the Smyrna cross. Now the rest of the lines are done over one. And let me zoom up because I did change that as well. Instead of doing a regular cross stitch over one, I did what is called continental or tenth stitch. Let's see if I can bring this up a little bit. There we go. So I did over one, but again, we're really close. So let me show you that stitch. Okay, zoom back out. I hope you don't mind all this zooming, but that way I could really show you what I found was helpful to me. All right, so let's go back to a handy dandy little paper here. So on our regular cross stitch, and we're doing over two, you're just making an X. Now you do have a choice of whether you go bottom to top, slanting to the left first, and then cross over toward the right. That's what I do, and I believe actually that's backwards <laughs> than from what most of you do, because almost everyone I see doing the right, the slanted toward the right cross first, and then finish with the left. I don't know. I just do the left first, and that's what I've always done. So, you know, I will show you my slant uh, with just the half cross, but whichever way is fine because we're doing an X. But here it is over two, here it is over one. You can see you're going over two threads here, here you're going over one. And the half cross. It's just the first half. Now I drew it as most people uh, stitch it, but then I'll show you mine. Now, when I was doing over one, I started to do some on my humming of the bees, and I found that it was sliding under the linen thread, which was very frustrating. So I just stopped because that was a choice I was making on a design choice, adding something. But on uh, Sarah, I couldn't stop because I'm gonna be doing all this stitching. So I thought, well, all right, let's figure out what to do. So I wanna show you how to do the half cross, and I will link a excellent blog post I saw on this on a needlepoint uh, site, and I will link to that. But here's one option for doing, this is called a half cross. You can see you go uh, from bottom to top, and then down here, bottom to top, almost like a sewing method. On the back, 
it will look like this. Now the problem I found is when I would do it this way, my thread, because I'm doing over one, was slipping underneath the linen thread. So this is what I did instead, which is a continental. A little bit different, looks the same on the front, but the back's going to look different. So we're going still the same direction as far as the slant, but we're going bottom to top, and then in, notice we're going the opposite direction, which means then when we bring up the next one, it's over here, and slant, then drop down, slant, and on the back, it will look like this, which for me, I didn't have as much slipping under the linen threads. So I worked my over one in what's called a continental stitch. It's similar to a half cross. It looks the same, but you can see, let me zoom out, they are done in a different way. I'll leave that up for just a second, so if you want to get a screenshot of it, but I will also post the link in the description. So let's go back to my stitching, and remember, my slants are going to be the opposite direction because I end up doing my slant to, let's see, be to the left first. Right, that's as close as I can get here. And I'm going to bring this up and try to hold it still. There we go. So you can see it's over one, and I did not have a problem with it slipping underneath the linen thread. Now I'm going to bring it over to the back. So you can see, let's take a look at, uh, looks like some of them I did with the half cross and some I did with the continental. I kind of just took it as I came to each section. Yeah, that's really close up on my work. <laughs> But that'll just show you what the back looks like. And let's go back to the front. So you do have the option of making the full cross on here. But that, again, was a personal choice that I decided on that when I'm looking at this, and I'm going to zoom back out, it looked fine to me. And actually, I preferred the little bit of openness there. But I believe on... The, uh, the original sampler, I think they did the full cross. So that's, again, personal choice, which you would like to do. So I hope that little tutorial on the Algerian eyelet, the Smyrna cross, and the half cross or tent stitch or continental stitch was helpful. As I mentioned before, I've been collecting lakeside linen, which I placed an order with traditional stitches in Canada, got on their list. So as certain colors came available, they would send it to me. This one came this in the last two weeks. This is Vintage Homespun by Lakeside. This is 40 count. And I thought what I would do is lay some of the lakeside linen I have side by side so you could see it, and then show you some of the other linens I have that are comparable. So this one is Vintage Homespun. This next one, I do not want to mix these up. This is Vintage Light Exemplar. So you can see this one's more golden. This one is more maybe camel color with a, just a bit of reddish brown in it. This is 
Now this is a different count, so the color, as you know, changes a bit on different counts. But this is 28 count Vintage Meadow Rue. This one's much darker. Still kind of a reddish brown. This is 40 count Maritime White. Now I'm going to lay it next to the homespun. As you can see, this one is a little bit, hmm, maybe more camel color. This is a little bit more yellow. All right, this um, is much lighter than this, and I've already forgotten which one this is. This is Maritime White. So a lighter version of that. And then the last one I have to show you is buttercream on 36 count. And you can see a little bit more gold and I hope the colors are coming through on the camera. I laid it on a gray cutting mat so um, you could see it. So I would say the vintage homespun and the vintage buttercream are kind of yellow base. You can see this one's a little bit darker. And then these are kind of a camely uh, with a little bit of brown or red, kind of a clay color. So now I'm going to put these back in place and show you some linens that I have pulled that are comparable. Because I know it's hard to find Lakeside, and there's certain brands you just can't find. So this will help you if you have a pattern and you're looking for something. Uh, so let's start with Vintage Homespun. And some of the linens that I have that looked similar, now not exact, but similar. Um, this is 40 count. So this first one is 46 count. I had that hog bristle. You can see it's a little darker but it is a similar color palette. So this is hog bristle, this is vintage homespun. This one is 46 count needle and flax, Pember, Pemberley. So this one, let me go back here. This one's a little bit lighter, but still in the same palette. And then this one is 36 count Winter Moon. And that one is a really good match too. So those are some options if you're looking for vintage homespun and you can't find it. Um, this is Winter Moon. And I don't have Who's That's By on my tag. Uh, this is Needle and Flax. Nope, this is Fox and Rabbit Hog Bristle and Needle and Flax Pemberley. So those are some good choices for you for the Vintage Homespun. All right, I have to keep these organized or I will never remember which is which. This is the Vintage Light Exemplar. Let me show you some, and not exactly, but similar. This is 40 count needle and flax brie. You can see it's a little darker, but it is in the same palette. So it's a little bit more, a little bit more red to it. This is a little bit uh, kind of red and golden, but similar. So that's one option. This one is Fox and Rabbit Mayflower. This one doesn't have as much modeling and is a little bit lighter, but similar. And I know there are other ones out there. I'm just pulling what I have in my stash. This is Fiber on a Whim Milk and Honey. Now this one's a little bit more tan. So I did not find a perfect match, but those are pretty good. I would say this one, it's a little darker, but this one was probably the most, uh, the closest. This is uh, 
Berea by Neelan Flax or Berea. Okay, let me set these aside and get the next one. This one's a dark one. This is the uh, Vintage Meadow Rue. I don't know if that's even available anymore, but in case you were looking for it. And I found, actually, this is Vintage Country Mocha, which was really close. So that might be a good option. It's a little bit lighter, but pretty close. Then this one is similar, a little darker. This is Weeks Dye Works Cocoa. Pretty close. And this one is Seraphin Old Attic. Old Attic Stationery? No, Old Stationery. So again, a little bit different, but pretty close. And I have one more. This one is a little bit more red. Uh, this is Sand Dune by Seraphin. It's a little bit lighter. And a little bit more red. So I think the other ones are a little uh, closer match. And I thought Vintage Country Mocha was very close. It's a little lighter, but very close. And let's do two more. This one is Maritime White. Love that. Use that for several things. So the ones that I found that were similar, this is Fiber on a Whim Latte. Now it's darker but the palette's similar. It's a little bit more golden, not a perfect match, but similar. I was just looking, this one is vintage light exemplar. No, they're... So that's, that's an option. It's not quite the same, but it's similar. This one is Cream and sugar. Is that fiber on a whim? I don't have it written down, but that one's very close to Maritime White. So, uh, cream and sugar. I really like that, that one. And one more. This is 40 count Needland Flax Alcott. Now this is darker quite a bit darker. So I'm going to pull that one. That one really doesn't work well with that. But I am. Oh, I don't want to mix those up. I do want to look. This is all cut. I'm just going to look to see. This is, uh, all right, this is a, this is, let me go this way. This is vintage light exemplar. This is the Alcott by Needle and Flax. Similar. This one's a little more red. This one's a little more tan, but could be an option. And let me show you one more that I pulled. And this one is 36 count vintage buttercream. I just have a little piece of this. Boy, that's pretty. And I found several that were similar. This one is XJU Light Hazelnut. It's a little bit darker, but very, very close. So that's, that one's a good option, Light Hazelnut by XJU. There's another one, Fiber on a Whim, Milk and Honey. Love that linen. It's a little bit more brown. It's a little bit more, um, well, buttercream. So that might be too brown. Look, this is vintage light exemplar. Those, okay, that's a good match right there. Let me move this out of the way. This is fiber on a whim, milk and honey. This is the vintage light exemplar, very similar. 
So that's another option for you for the vintage light exemplar. Okay, move this and bring the vintage buttercream back. And one more. You saw this, I think it was last video. This is Amber Waves by Atomic Ranch Linen. Very nice option. So you can see that you do have some options, um, some more than others, and I'm sure there are, are linens that would work um, that I don't have because I don't have a lot. <laughs> I just pulled what I had uh, to show you. So I hope you enjoyed that little comparison of different linens. I hope you enjoyed those two videos. I made them separately because I had to put the uh, camera at a different angle. So I hope they were helpful. I hope you enjoyed them. I feel like this is a short video, although once I get everything put together, it might not be. But as always, I wanna thank you for joining me. I love reading your comments and thank you for your comments. And I just thought of something I didn't show you when I said comments. The other thing that helped me when I was picking that out and doing the over one, we've talked about the halo lamp before, but when you lift this up, it has a magnifier and I've been using that when I've been doing the over one. And reminded me because I had a comment when I showed this before, reminding me and thank you for that comment. When you're using a lamp with a magnifier, if you have the sun coming through this and it's shining on something, it actually could set it on fire. So this halo lamp has the lid, so I always make sure I'm closed it. Even if I step away to get a cup of coffee or answer the phone, I always close it. If you have one of the magnifiers that does not have this little lid, Many people will put a tea towel over it or actually make a little cover for it. But you do want to make sure that you have that covered. Even if you think, oh no, the sun's not going to come through here. Just to make sure. So when I said thank you for your comments, that reminded me. I didn't talk about that comment. But thank you for your comments. I love reading them. Remember to put in your comments if... You have a chart that you can recall like, oh yeah, 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 that particular chart would work well on a pumpkin color. Let me know. And then next time we'll talk about some things I pulled that I'm looking at. I'm just checking my notes. Um, I will put several things in the description, links to um, talking about uh, the over one website and I also put traditional stitches website in there because that's where I ordered the lakeside linen. I forgot to talk about the quilt I had behind me last time so I'll quickly talk about this one. This is a Lone Star design that I did. I call it Lone Star Illusions and it's a booklet that I wrote. It's available at Paper Pieces. I will put that in the link as well. It's not a paper pieced design. But what I have discovered is a way to do diamonds, and that's what we use for a Lone Star, but we're not cutting diamonds. We're cutting half score triangles, putting them together, and it creates my Lone Star Illusion quilts. I did a video on it. I think I did a video. I did do a quilt talk on several of the Lone Star Illusions. So check the channel playlist and look for quilt talk and you'll see I think I did at least one I might have done two maybe I thought I did two and just wrote up information but I know I did at least one so it'll give you some information about my Lone Star Illusions quilts so I think that's it for today again thank you for joining me this has just been a special time. I love chatting with you. I love reading your comments. I love watching floss tubes. It's like getting together with a group of friends. And I know my husband was, we were talking the other day and we actually cut the cord on cable because we just don't watch it. He watches golf and I watch floss tube. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, of course we have, I think, um, YouTube TV is what we decided in the interim, but now we're talking about maybe just subscribing to the Golf Channel and maybe one other uh, channels because there's a lot of information you can get without uh, having cable or even a streaming service. So I don't know. I, we're keeping track of that. And if we don't watch those much, we're just going to cut the cord on that too. And, you know, we can always resubscribe if we want. But again, it's like I'm rambling now. So I am going to sign off. Thank you for joining me today. It's been a pleasure to be with you. And until next time, happy stitching and be well.